everyone. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to be here with you all today for the sixth installment of our advocacy trading series. Um, I sincerely want to thank everyone who has um, joined us for the past sessions. If today is your first session, I Thank you, just the same. Um, so happy to have you all here with us. And in today's um, in today's installment, we are going to be covering how to apply all the lessons that we've learned in the previous sessions to closer to home. So um, just really quickly um, about Schoolhouse Connection, if this does happen to be your first time joining us today, um, Schoolhouse Connection is a national nonprofit that um, works to overcome homelessness through education. And we do that through strategic advocacy efforts and also providing technical assistance to schools, um, early childhood programs, institutions of higher education, service providers, and also families and youth. Um, if you want to know more about Schoolhouse, of course, check out our website, www.schoolhouseconnection.org. And as always, I encourage everyone to sign up for our newsletter for important updates on resources, on um, federal and state policies, and all of the good stuff. And um, if you're not aware, um, my name is Alian Anderson, and I am the Policy and Outreach Associate for Schoolhouse Connection. And um, I will leave it to my colleague Patricia to introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone, and I apologize for a lot of background noise I have here. This is Patricia Julianelle. I'm the Senior Strategist for Program Advancement and Legal Affairs at Schoolhouse Connection. Thanks, Eliane. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, so just some quick housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use our questions pane. It should be towards the right-hand side of your screen. Um, the PowerPoint is also going to be available in your handouts panel and after the webinar you will also receive um, a link to the recording in your email after that so you'll have access to the presentation um, after this and you can also find the archives of all our other previous sessions there as well so um, in our series the other sessions that um, we the session that we've had before we covered getting grounded um, advocacy in the new congress how to effectively communicate with congress what successful advocacy looks like and we learn from peers um, using media and social media to boost legislative advocacy how to and how to engage parents and youth with lived experience in advocacy and then today we're applying these closer to home so um, before we get um, further on into today's lesson just a quick recap um, of some of the stuff is here of like the things we covered in previous sessions um, we covered um, the imperativeness of constituent engagement the dynamics of the 117th congress best strategies for communicating with congress um, do's and don'ts for and preparation what to do afterwards when you set up a meeting with a member of congress um, why some of your peers make time for advocacy lessons that they learned and we'll hear a bit more about that today but we'll get to that soon um, why media is important for advocacy and then last week we also covered why we engage parents and youth what this looks like what this engagement looks like and our principles of youth engagement which is a document that um, was prepared by another member of our SHC team and we're also going to be having a more in-depth um, webinar on that coming up as well so um, you can all definitely look out for that and then you know as I mentioned the archive versions of all of these webinars are available on our website as well under the learn tab and then you just click archive webinars and everything will be there um, so some of our objectives for today um, we're going to be covering um, federal and state level advocacy um, it's different but complementary we're going to hear from a state legislator as well um, we're going to look at some of SHC's past successful state advocacy efforts state policy 101 we're also going to hear from one another one of our peers today and um, we're also going to discuss our our new state policy community of practice so I am so excited to um, let you all know and introduce our presenters today. Um, our, one of our presenters is State Representative Mary Gonzalez from El Paso, Texas. She'll be joining us in a moment. And we also have Alex Taboski, who is the Board Director of Family Promise in Indiana. So thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Thank you. 
And then so to get into the content, um, so federal and state policy, like we know, of course, there are like three different levels of government. There's local, there's state, and there's federal. And, you know, they, of course, have their differences, but state and federal policy actually work um, they work very well together. They're definitely complementary um, despite their differences. Some of the differences being um, the timing. At the federal level, um, things move at a much slower pace in comparison to the states, um, especially seeing as states have, um, there, are, there are quite a few states who have um, specified time slots, specified um, time slots for their legislative sessions. Like they may go on for like, um, uh, a few months, like for example, in Texas, the legislature um, occurs for five months every two years. So everything that's supposed to be captured in that is captured within those five months. So things are super quick, but it all depends on your state as well. Um, the issues are also different. For example, at the federal level, some of the things that are relevant to homeless children, youth and families is um, at the federal level with, with more focus on funding levels for federal programs, um, if and how funds are targeted to specific populations, eligibility rules, um, and state requirements. At the state level, we, um, we look at some of the issues that relate to homeless children and youth that are covered, our minor consent for un un unaccompanied homeless youth in terms of um, receiving medical care and stuff of the likes, um, even access to important documents. We also cover graduation requirements, um, higher education access, state pre-K eligibility, sorry about that, um, state funding for services and um, eviction and rental assistance as well. Um, the opportunities for advocacy differ, differ as well at the federal and state level. At the federal level, of course, we have quite a few opportunities, which um, some, of, some of the things that, you know, we went through and we looked through when we were um, in our previous sessions, but there are also even more at the state level because it's a, a place where you're even closer to the policymakers. Um, there are just way more opportunities, but um, I will, I know we have Representative Gonzalez with us now, and I'm so happy to have her here with us. Um, Representative Gonzalez is a champion for education. Um, she served and vice chaired on the Public Education Committee in the Texas Legislature. Um, she has also been recognized by Latina Leaders Magazine for her incredible work in the field of education. And she's also a former boss of mine. So welcome, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ali. I'm really excited to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. So I, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for all the work that your organization does to really make sure that folks and our most vulnerable and marginalized people don't fall through the public policy cracks. So thank you so much. So I'm going to talk briefly because I'm actually in the middle of committee hearings um, about the impact that y'all can really have in this moment in time. And I think now more than ever, voices are, are um, your voices and the amplification of those are critical and can have direct impact. So I'll give an example. In Texas right now, because of COVID-19, things um, before we would have about 10,000 bills and we would have hearings and all those bills because we're trying to minimize being in spaces together as much as possible, we're hearing less bills. That means like advocacy, hearing from people like these bills need hearings, these bills need to move um, is even more critical because without that, those bills will never have an opportunity to have be part of the process. Um, as well as, you know, now with social media and online Zooms, I was having a talk with a, one of my colleagues and he said, I've never talked to so many people because before it would be so hard, but now with Zoom and even like this, you can talk to so many more people and engage more one-on-one. -on -one. Is it different? Yes. Um, do we have to think critically about building authentic and intentional con connections in a technological world, yes. But does it mean that maybe people who didn't have access to legislators have maybe greater access because of opportunity online? Definitely. And how do we capitalize that space and that opportunity? And so um, I'm just reading some notes. I'm so sorry. And so what it, the questions are like, how can people best engage with state legislators? And so here's my number one answer. A lot of times when folks come to engage with state legislators, they come once and then they come for 10 minutes and brief us or 15 minutes and sometimes even longer if it's a deeper conversation. 
But I think what I would always tell people is I'll give an example. And today alone, I have been dealing with an agriculture issues and import export lots. I had to be I had to be in the public public education committee all day where we heard everything from testing to special ed needs to um, suicide prevention. And then I had to go to another committee where I was dealing with land and resource management, eminent domain issues, um, fractionalized lots. And then I'm going to go to the appropriations meeting in a little while to deal with our budget issues. So if you think about a day and all the issues, sometimes it's hard for us to continue to remember, even as critical and important as a meeting is, all of the things we need to remember from a meeting. So I tell people, how do you build real relationships in the world outside of politics? You engage with people frequently, you send reminders. So I always tell people, in order for a legislator, and this is kind of dig on us, to really hear something, you should connect with them seven times. So how am I strategically and intentionally thinking about beyond that one moment? How am I building a network with their staff? And I think being really intentional about that work and really strategic will result in the most authentic relationships that then do create change. Um, so I will say this, because of what happened with COVID-19, now more than ever, we need to be the strongest advocates. And so for those of you who are watching and want to continue thinking and strategizing, I'm happy to be a thought partner in how do we create change? Because I'm really fortunate while I'm a state legislator in Texas, I'm also the chair of the Board of Hispanic Caucus Chairs where I work with state legislators all over the country. And so if you're in a different state and you want to think about things, I'm here for that because ultimately um, we're, we're a team in solidarity trying to really make the world a better place. And I know, Ali, you said there might be some questions, so I guess I can take a few questions, or if not, I can do whatever you need me to do. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I, um, if anyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot them in the questions pane. I don't see any right now, but in the meanwhile, um, do you have any final thoughts or tips? Yeah, so final top, uh, uh, tips. Please, please um, utilize all the tools that are existing in the moment. So now, like I said, now more than ever, technology is our friend. Um, people are always online. At, at first, I would I was always a little bit more hesitant of online advocacy because I felt that people were like, oh, I sent that email, I'm done. I do feel like online advocacy in this moment is having a significant impact. So to do that, but also complement it as much as you can with um, other areas of co connectivity, whether it's um, phone calls or whether it's Zoom meetings, et cetera. And so um, I, I, will, uh, I will say, so state policy making is a marathon, right? Not a race sometimes. And so, you know, I feel that what I always like to tell people who are working on public policy is never get discouraged because what's the alternative? The alternative is these issues aren't discussed. And so we have to continue to push, move the ball forward always, um, even if it doesn't feel like it's moving, even not letting issues be silent or invisible is critical work in itself. Awesome, uh, amazing words. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we don't seem to have any questions, but we do have one hello from Yuma, Arizona. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good. But thank you so much for joining us. I know that you have to rush back off to your um, hearing, but thank you so much for joining us and sharing all these wonderful words with us. Thanks, Alan. Thank you for all the work you do. Talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye, Mary. Okay. All right, um, so jumping back into everything, I um, just want to do like a quick refresher for everyone um, who isn't sure um, if you're new with us, like if you're not sure whether or not you can, if you're not sure whether or not you can advocate um, because of maybe lobbying restrictions, especially persons who work at school districts. Um, so the difference between advocacy and lobbying is advocacy is any activity used to influence policy, which includes educating on issues, providing information, and arguing a cause but um, conversely lobbying is more arguing for a specific legislation so um, lobbying by definition it, um, is classified as activities that ask legislators to take a specific position on a specific piece of legislation or urge others to do the same so um, in 
with advocacy, you're allowed to um, inform persons, inform your policymakers and key stakeholders about the issue, like about um, homeless children and youth in your in your area, what's going on. But lobbying is more asking for support on a specific bill. So just wanted to go through that quickly for anyone who may not have seen our previous webinars where we included this. Um, and then getting now into the nitty gritty of state, pol state policy specifically. So we kind of want to talk about like, um, do an orientation to your state legislature. Um, so there are a couple of questions that you have to ask yourself um, once engaging in state policy. That um, These questions are what party is in control of each chamber, because um, this can greatly influence the policy that um, the policies that you're able to change, but not all the time. Um, who chairs relevant committees, for example, if you know that your primary concern is K-12 education and homeless children and youth um, it, at that level, you might look for the public education committee rather than um, the higher education committee. Um, how often does your legislature meet, which I touched on a little bit earlier, and when does your legislature convene or adjourn? And you can find this information on congress.gov, so on the federal website as well, there is this link that we have here um, that takes you to um, various state legislature websites. It has like all the hyperlinks for all the states, so you're e able to easily find um, your state and a similar service provided by Ballotopedia, uh, by, by Ballotpedia right there, which once again, this will be in your handouts and you'll be able to access this again um, on our website afterwards. Um, so meeting with key legislators, who should meet? You should meet. Um, you should meet um, as constituents, as key stakeholders, um, which we'll um, kind of get into some more examples of that a little bit later. And also anyone who you might know, any, someone in your network with a personal or professional connection to the policymaker or legislator, legislator um, you should meet with key legislative influencers like um, such as Mary, for example, like because she sits on the public education committee, so that could influence a lot of things at the K-12 level for um, homeless children and youth. Keep the, key, the same com key committee chairs and your own representative. So it isn't as specific at the federal level. I don't know if you all, you may recall, um, um, oftentimes the meetings will be with um, the person who represents you, but at the state level, you get much more of an opportunity to um, meet with all the different key um, key persons um, within the legislature, whether that is your representative, whether that's a committee chair, etc. Um, when should meetings happen? They should happen both during and outside of legislative sessions and whenever issues appear in the press or in influential spaces, um, whenever something relevant to the issue that you are advocating on um, is, um, say it becomes a hot topic, that would be a great time to also set up a meeting and also doing follow-up as well is important and some things to bring with you, um, an issue brief or a one-pager, which we also discussed in, um, se in session two, um, anecdotes from what you've been seeing to describe your own experience and one or two specific requests and also contact information. And um, we're just going to um, just quickly breeze through this um, with in terms of like constructing the legislative issue briefs or one pagers. This is something we also discussed before, but just a couple of points. Keep them short, have a simple ask, um, connect compelling data to current priorities, like larger priorities, like larger issues, for example, um, where we see a lot of pers a lot more persons now paying attention to the issue of racial equity, but we also know that homeless children and youth are disproportionately um, persons of color. So um, finding some way to connect these, that would be great as well. And also um, referencing comparable states with like similar laws or, or policies that you're advocating for um, in, in your ask as well. And then here we just have um, a couple of examples of how you can set up the meetings. So at the state level, we suggest that you um, email both the legislative director of your representative and also the scheduler um, of the representative that you're trying to meet with. Send an email include with the purpose of your meeting, um, introducing yourself, of course, um, whoever else is going to be coming with you and the topic that you want to be, um, the topic that you're requesting the meeting to discuss. Um, and also, if you have a constituent state that they are constituents, of course, 
And um, as Mary touched on, so many offices have switched to virtual and socially distanced meetings since the pandemic. Um, staff, once you email these staff, like they'll reply with a time that they can meet or they'll find someone else in the office who's available at the time. But generally, um, we suggest at the state level, you do ask to meet with the representative themselves. First and foremost, um, as, um, a lot of times they will be, um, they are willing and available to meet with you and there. It's um, much more accessible to meet with a state policymaker in comparison to a member of Congress. So um, it's definitely important for you to take advantage of that opportunity at the state level and um, build and foster those relationships. And um, this is just a list of some of the key stakeholders that I mentioned a bit earlier. Um, so if you're a liaison, you are a key stakeholder in terms of the issue of um, children, youth and families experiencing homelessness, also early childhood providers, um, the COCs, housing providers, um, youth and parents themselves, um, et cetera. And um, of course, note that stakeholders, the number of stakeholders or who is classified as a stakeholder might increase once a group settles on like an advocacy plan, like if you are advocating with a group, but just some things to pay attention to as well. And I will turn it over to Patricia um, for her to discuss SHC's theory of change. Thanks, Eliane. Um, again, I apologize if there's noise in the background. I've got a construction project happening across the street, so I apologize for that. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the state policy work that Schoolhouse Connection does and the approach that we take to it. Um, and as Alian mentioned, you know, there are a lot of differences with state policy, one of them being so many of the policies that really directly affect children and youth are state laws, not federal laws. And so a lot of the really important changes that we need to make uh, need to be, happen on the state level. They really can't happen on the federal level. Um, so what we try to do with Schoolhouse Connection is, you know, we recognize that we have a certain amount of expertise with policy work. We have, you know, lawyers on staff. We know how to write laws and all that sort of thing. But we are not experts in what's happening in any particular community or state. The people who live there, um, the young people and the families who are experiencing homelessness there, they're the experts on what is needed and what is happening in any particular community or state. So what we try to do is, is basically offer our assistance to advocates um, within a state. We like to get as much information as we possibly can. So we um, do surveys. We do surveys specifically of young people so we can hear directly from them about what they're experiencing as policy needs and policy barriers, um, as well as surveying all those other stakeholders that uh, Alain mentioned on the previous slide. Um, we like to have open stakeholder meetings with as many people as possible to just come and tell us, you know, what they're experiencing, what's getting in their way, what they'd like to see changed. Um, and once we listen and learn from the local community, then we can, in partnership with them, do that advocacy work, um, build a consensus around some shared policy priorities. Um, we might not agree about everything uh, in any given community, but most of the time there are a lot of issues that everybody's really on the same page about um, and that people can really unite behind so that when people are reaching out to their legislators, like we heard from Representative Gonzalez, um, it's not just one person one time, but it's multiple people multiple times, really building momentum behind the issue of family and youth homelessness, educating, excuse me, policymakers, because of course, you know, those of us who work on homelessness, we think about it all day, every day, um, but most of our policymakers probably aren't even aware that there's family or youth homelessness in their communities. So we're trying to do um, that really constant education and building that momentum. Um, and then definitely nonpartisan. Um, you know, I've worked uh, in many, many state legislatures around the country. I've worked in places like Texas, where there's a Republican supermajority, and places like California, where there's a Democratic supermajority, and other states where it's more balanced. Um, and, you know, wherever we work and whatever party we're working with, we find really passionate advocates for families and youth. Um, so to us, it's not a partisan issue. There certainly are. Um, different priorities that different parties have, and you have to kind of work with that. Um, but we uh, we find that um, it, it, homelessness in particular isn't and doesn't need to be a partisan issue. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patricia. And with that, I will turn it over to our other special guest, Alex. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm with I'm a former board, let's go back to the first slide. I'm with the uh, Family Promise of Greater Indianapolis. I was former board president. I'm now on the board and I'm chairman of our Policy and Awareness Committee. 
For those of you who don't know about Family Promise, pre-pandemic, we provided shelter and support to homeless families. And we did it through housing homeless families in churches and synagogues in our community. They would open up their buildings, convert classrooms into bedrooms. Volunteers would provide meals, drive vans, provide support. And we had a staff back at our day center where we had social workers, a computer center, and so forth. So um, that's a little background on, on Family Promise. We're in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is a major blue city in the midst of a very red state. The state legislature has a supermajority in both houses. The Republican Party has a supermajority in both houses and the governor is Republican. So that sort of sets the context in which we work. Go on, while we go to the second slide, I'm gonna talk about our experience over the last, well, two years, trying to deal with issues of eviction. And our goal is to reduce evictions in the state of Indiana. We've been, in operations in Indianapolis for I think 28 years, we've never been involved in a lot of a lot of advocacy. But in 2019, something just stood out, brought evictions to we couldn't avoid it. The New York Times published an article showing that Indianapolis had the second largest number of evictions of any city in the United States, second only to New York City. And you can see the numbers here. And obviously New York City is much, much, much larger than, uh, than Indianapolis. So that just, we always knew there was a problem with evictions. But when we saw this, these numbers, which were produced by the eviction lab at uh, Princeton University, we decided we had to do something we decided we needed to start an advocacy program and um, try to do something about evictions. First thing we did, we started doing research. And we talked to uh, legal aid, we talked to various legal groups, we talked to state senators, we talked to state representatives, and we did research. And what we concluded was the Indiana tenant landlord laws. Why don't you stay back on these slides. Uh, the uh, Indiana tenant landlord laws were heavily in favor of landlords. And we concluded that if we were gonna help people uh, with evictions, there needed to be a change in the tenant landlord laws. So we started on a program of one, talking to people in the state legislature, and two, trying to raise awareness in the community about evictions. This slide, you'll wonder what this is that's, that you're seeing on your screen right now. Our executive director likes to use this chart uh, when he makes presentations about uh, homelessness and about evictions. And what it is, we get calls from people from families looking for housing. And we have a, a sheet where we check off the number of calls we get and the number of people we have to turn away because we don't have additional uh, adequate capacity. And this is a chart for the first day when our executive director started to work in uh, 2018. And he points out that every day we were turning away 10 some days 20, some days 30 families, because there simply were not enough beds available in our system to uh, handle the demand. We and, and we use this to illustrate we have an eviction problem because we think 90, probably 100% of the homeless families that called us for housing, for shelter, had been evicted. So in uh, 2019, to raise awareness, we had a program. We invited uh, people who represented our volunteers at our congregations 
and people who support our activities and had about a two had about 200 people into a meeting and talked about the eviction problem we had one of the uh, uh, a woman who was the mother of a family we had helped who had, who had we had hosted talk about her experience with evictions and how her landlord had tried to tried to evict her and she had gone to court and the judge had ruled in her favor but despite that her the attempt to have her evicted was on her record on her permanent record so when she went later to apply for a, a house housing for a rental unit that eviction was on our permanent record and that was one of the issues we were concerned about and uh, we also brought in people from legal aid and various other people in that conference to talk about evictions and how we needed to change uh, next slide very soon after that in January, the mayor of Indianapolis, Mayor Hogsett, introduced two bills in city council, which we supported. We talked to city council people. We were there at city council supporting the vote on this bill. And basically, uh, the, the mayor introduced two ordinances, both of which we strongly favored. One, the city introduced a bill that would provide $250,000 to provide legal aid to tenants who were facing eviction. Because in some states, uh, tenants have a right to have uh, legal aid when they face eviction. In Indiana, they don't. But the city proposed a bill to provide $250,000 to provide legal assistance. Second, in a separate ordinance, the uh, city proposed a bill that landlords who kick out renters for seeking help from attorneys, code enforcement, or, or uh, health inspectors would be punished. We had a situation where people who were living in housing, in rental housing, that was simply inhabitable, and where they called the health department the landlord would just retaliate and kick them out so in this second bill they protected residents in unlivable conditions from retaliation and they guaranteed that every renter when they signed the contract with their landlord would get a paper a document listing their rights and responsibilities by law that would have to be attached uh to the contract so we were very happy when this was introduced in city council we were ecstatic when this was passed by city council but the same day the same day city council voted on this down the street indianapolis is the state capital down the street from from the city hall in the state house the state legislature in a house committee introduced an amendment to an existing bill that would pre preempt the right of the city of indianapolis to pass such a law and um it would mean that even though the city passed a law reg giving tenants protection against retaliation even though the city passed a law saying the landlord had to provide the tenant a rule uh, document with their rights and responsibilities the state decided that the city didn't have authority to do that and the the uh, a bill in house committee was amended with no advance notice and very little opportunity for any testimony. The bill was inspired by the Indiana Apartment Association. 
And so the same day that uh, the city passed what we thought was a very progressive bill, the state legislature in the House committee amended an existing bill to prevent the city from doing that. So that put tenant protection proposals in Indianapolis and in every other city in Indiana in jeopardy. The bill prevented any city in the state from doing anything with tenant landlord laws unless they got permission from the General Assembly. So we organized. Um, we called in all the housing organizations, all the organizations that did with homeless people, all the organizations that were fighting for evictions. And then we asked those organizations to call in their friends who may not be in housing organizations, who may not be involved in homeless organizations, but who understood the issue. And we were able to pull together in a very short period of time, signatures from nearly 300 organizations and individuals, who, some who advocate on tenant landlord laws, some who deal with the populations affected, but many of them were organizations who just knew it was morally wrong to have the state legislature prevent the city from doing this. So we had organizations from uh, the ACLU, we had AARP, we had numerous churches in, in throughout the state, we had United Way agencies, we had a large number of people come together and put that letter in. In addition, we asked them to call, write, contact, their senators, their representatives, to explain their opposition to this bill. And this came together very quickly in a matter of weeks. And this was just before the pandemic uh, started. Um, and we had people testify in, in the Senate against this bill. Um, and we reached out to the media and we got very good coverage. But despite all this, oh, and we had one other thing. We had um, city uh, business and city leaders uh, coming out against this bill that would prevent Indianapolis from uh, giving rights to tenants. But despite all this, the legislature passed the bill and sent it to the governor for signature. So the next thing we did, next slide, uh, we went to the governor and we, again, all out campaign, calling on our friends, calling on other organizations to write, contact, email, telephone, the governor and ask the governor to veto this legislation and weeks passed and there was a deadline when the governor either had to sign the legislation veto the legislation or let it become law without a signature so time passed time passed time passed and he signed most of the bills the vast majority of the bills the legislature had passed that session and he didn't do anything for our bill and until the last day when he had to make a decision either to let it pass without a signature, veto it or sign it, and he vetoed it. We had a victory. So the city could roll out their um, tenant protection regulations. They could roll out, and they had written this document that every landlord had to pass, had to attach to their um, uh, leases, and that went into effect. So a couple of things came out of this, and I'll keep on with the story. I think we have time. 
um, since all these people had come together to fight the bill in the legislature, to call for the governor's veto, we realized we needed to form a formal coalition of organizations in the city who advocate for housing. There are a lot of housing organizations. There were a lot of organizations that deal with homeless families, homeless people, but we had never come together in a former form, formal coalition. So very rapidly, we created the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition. Steering Committee uh, were AARP, Coalition for Homeless Intervention and Prevention, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, Family Promise of Greater Indianapolis, our organization, the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the Indiana Institute for Working Families, Prosperity Indiana, and the Ross Foundation, which is a tenant union that represents tenants. So we came together, formed the formal organization, formal coalition. We don't have staff. It's all done with people from the various constituent organizations. And the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition over the last year has worked on two or three things. One, we continue to advocate with the state legislature and the governor on homeless issues, on housing issues, but the pandemic had started. So that became an issue where we had to relate to the state administration about state moratorium, rental assistance, and so forth. So we now had a vehicle that represented all these organizations where we could go to the state administration and I, and I want to be clear in Indiana the state legislature was not meeting in the summer it was not meeting during most of the pandemic so we had to deal with the various administrative agencies in the state government but we were able to do this with a unified voice which really we hadn't had before Next slide. Then the legislature came back in the session this fall. And although the governor had vetoed the bill last year, and although the provisions of the bill were in effect, the legislature, members of the legislature decided they wanted to override the governor's veto. And so uh, we heard through the grapevine that mm, several members of the legislature were going to try and override the veto. We were able to go to the media, get support. This is a weekly business journal calling for the legislature to let the veto stand. We used our contacts to get organizations and individuals to uh, contact their members of the legislature to urge them not to override the veto. And we, we, we pulled together more organizations. This is uh, the Greater Indianapolis Multi-Faith Alliance, a collection of about 30 or 40 congregations, but we had other groups too. And we worked heavily on this. Now, one of the complications under the Indiana rules of the General Assembly, they did not have to give notice when they were going to vote to override the veto, and they didn't have to have a hearing. So any time during the session, they could bring up a vote in the House and then bring up a vote in the Senate to override the legislation, which they did. So after our victory in the beginning of the year, in the beginning of 2020, 2020, in 2021, a year later, we had a defeat. The state legislature overrode the governor's veto. 
and the bill the governor veto became law immediately immediately canceling the, the the law in the city of indianapolis and immediately canceling any other similar laws in cities anywhere in the state of indiana so today where we are is we are continuing to lobby advocate call talk to members of the legislature, urging them to pass additional legislation, which will mitigate the provisions in this bill they put into law. So lessons learned. I think the biggest lesson we learned, despite what we hear from, uh, or we read in textbooks, despite what we hear from consultants, despite what we're told by members of the legislature about how a bill becomes law, how the legislature works, how you interact with your representative or senators, oftentimes it acts strangely. Oftentimes, um, the state legislature acts in strange ways. They don't give you opportunity to have testimony. They don't give you notice of a bill. And too often, they don't listen to strong protest from the community. So, that's one lesson learned. Second lesson I think we've learned, um, in many Republican dominated legislatures, there is increasing emphasis on preempting what local jurisdictions can do. So in Indiana, and we I don't think we're an exception, I think we've seen this around the country, in addition to preempting the city of Indianapolis and the eviction law, there have been attempts to preempt the city of Indianapolis on zoning laws, on provisions for transportation services, and on a number of other issues. We are seeing growing interest in state legislatures on preemption legislation. Third thing we learned, call your contacts, develop your contract contacts, raise awareness among people who are not typically involved in housing issues or in homelessness issues. And one of the things we did, and it's gonna take time to, to have effect, um, many of you may have read the book Evicted by, that won, I think, Pulitzer Prize several years ago where it's a book, uh, the author spends time with people going through eviction in Milwaukee, spends time with tenants, and writes a, 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 a wonderful book documenting the challenges of eviction and pointing out that eviction, well, most people think eviction causes uh, poverty, or, or rather poverty causes eviction. The book says eviction often causes poverty that people are in stable situations and they get evicted and it pushes them down into poverty. So we get, developed a reading guide and put it out in the community and we got a number of religious congregations, churches to read the book and follow our reading guide. And we got a number of other organizations in the community to use the reading guide. And we believe this raised awareness in the community about the problems of eviction. The other thing we are doing right now, we've reached out to the various organizations who do deal with the deal with homeless, deal with, with housing, to get stories that we can take to members of the legislature. So we're not just reporting statistics, numbers, we're second to New York, but we're giving people stories, especially where people have been evicted because they reported inhabitable situations in their rental units. So very quickly, um, that's my story. Perhaps one other lesson we learned, 
It takes multiple sessions of the legislature often to get things done. We may bring something up this year. We may get some interest this year. Next year, we may get a hearing. And maybe it takes the third or fourth year before we get legislation passed. So that very quickly, that's our story. Thank you so much for that, Alex. I'm sure we all learned a lot from your story. And um, it's, it's especially your last point, I completely agree. Um, and I know Patricia can speak a little bit more about that as well. We'll turn to Patricia next um, to just speak about some of SHC's successes so far. And uh, maybe she can describe like how long they took as well. Thanks, Sally Ann. Yeah, and I won't go over, you know, all of these laws in detail. There's plenty of information on our website. We have um, lots and lots of details about all of these different pieces of legislation if anybody's interested in more. But um, maybe just uh, sort of just some case studies. And like you said, um, you know, definitely it can take multiple years to get things done. Oftentimes what we try to do is go for a particular policy that maybe it's a little bit easier. And by that, I just mean it's not as controversial. It's something that everybody can kind of get behind, not a lot of opposition, um, doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, try to do something like that uh, in a first year as a way to raise goodwill, raise momentum, bring the coalition together, have a victory so that people can feel excited about that and educate uh, legislators about the issue overall and kind of tackle that before we move into some more uh, controversial issues. Um, you know, one of the most difficult issues that we deal with very frequently is around the rights of minors, youth under 18, who might be experiencing homelessness on their own. And of course, um, most state laws require people to be 18 before they can make all kinds of different decisions for themselves. Um, but if you're a youth on your own and you don't have your parents uh, available to provide that kind of consent or support for you, then you run into a whole lot of trouble accessing things like um, bank accounts, your own birth certificate, medical care, housing, shelter, et cetera. So um, we've been really active over the past few years on those kinds of uh, bills, which tend to be pretty controversial, um, but we have a pretty good record of getting them passed. And I think part of that is because, you know, we have worked to build up awareness and to educate legislators before that. And particularly, you know, partners working in those states have been doing that for a long time. Um, also, I think, I talked earlier about involving young people and parents directly in policy work and the importance of that. And that's another uh, kind of secret to success, I think, is when you have young people um, testifying directly before their legislators. Um, you know, that's when I see legislators actually putting down their cell phones and being quiet and listening and asking questions and really paying attention. It's when it's uh, a person talking about their own life and their own experiences and what they needed to be successful. Um, and, you know, those are the people who should be speaking because it's their expertise and their and their lives uh, to share. So um, that's another thing that we've been able to do, as well as the constituents who are most impacted. So some of the higher education and legislation that we've worked on, for example, it's wonderful when we can get um, professors to testify for it or higher education leadership to testify um, so that legislators can see that, well, this is the agency that's going to be impacted by this and they think it's a good idea. And then we also have students who think it's a good idea. So we kind of have a, a well-rounded constituency uh, supporting a particular piece of legislation that, that helps to convince legislators that, well, you know, all the experts around the table are telling me this is a good idea. So I guess it's probably a good idea. Um, so that's another thing that, that we've done. Um, and another issue, I guess, is just implementation. Uh, you know, getting policies passed is great, but a lot of times they just sort of sit on the books and they don't actually get implemented or enforced. So we've been working a lot lately on implementation, and that's just also another opportunity to educate state agencies and to educate legislators as well, so that a lot of times, you know, we might start working with an agency uh, to try to implement a particular law. A good example here is our work with, for example, the Nevada Department of Education, um, where there's a partial credit bill that was passed there to help address the stresses of mobility on students who move around a lot due to foster care or homelessness. Um, and we were able to do, really we're going on 18 months of work with, in partnership with the Nevada Department of Education to implement that law, make sure schools have the resources and support they need to implement it, and make sure that students are getting the benefit of the law. So 
um, those implementation efforts are really important to make sure that laws are actually in place for students and, and, and for youth and families, but also it's another great way to just build relationships and build awareness. Um, so I think those are just some of the kind of high level uh, strategies, I guess, based on our experience. And again, um, as you can see on the slides, you know, we've worked on issues like vital documents, minor consent, higher education, um, access to health care, K-12 education. So we do a variety of different kinds of things, um, but the strategies are always pretty similar and always absolutely coming from grassroots, coming from service providers, schools, and definitely from youth and families themselves. So um, just to kind of give people a preview, in case there's anyone on the call from any of these states, if you're interested in knowing the state legislation that Schoolhouse Connection is working on in any of these states um, where we're working this year or the states that we're looking forward to for 2022, um, we, again, we, you know, we're always open. We love to have as many people at the table as possible. So anybody who might be here today, if you're from any of those states and you'd like to know what we're working on or hopefully maybe you'd like to be involved in it, um, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, to me, and um, I think my contact information is in the PowerPoint, but it's also all over our website. So there's uh, never any any problem with trying to reach me, and I'll I'll pop my email address into the chat box as well, so everyone can see that. Okay, thank you so much, Patricia. And then finally, turning to uh, my com my colleague Tamar Lewis to discuss our state policy community activities. Yeah, thanks, Alian, um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about the community of practice. Um, the Building Teams for Change community of practice is an initiative that our state policy team is launching. Our first event is actually this upcoming Thursday. Um, it's going to be Thursday, March 25th from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And we're, our title for this session is State Policy 101, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So if you found like there were aspects of today's presentation or even some of the other uh, federal webinar presentations that really resonated with you and you were just curious about drilling down and finding more specifics, this would be a great opportunity to join. We would love to have you. Our sessions will be every other month um, for the rest of 2021. And so that'll be um, May up until November. And so some of the other topics that we'll be discussing include uh, best, practice, best practices in accessing and using data, as well as um, understanding the needs of special populations and then ways to best engage with them. We're also gonna have a bit of focus at this Thursday session on um, best practices in adult and youth collaboration where another Schoolhouse Connection staff member, Jordan, um, who presented last week, will be able to dive into her youth engagement principles a bit more. So we're so excited about this initiative. I'm gonna wrap up just in case there are questions so folks can um, can ask our panelists, but we would, we would love to have you. So any questions that you may have about the community of practice, feel free to send to me, um, Tamara at schoolhealthconnection.org, or feel free to send to Patricia at Patricia schoolhealthconnection.org. Awesome, thank you so much, Tamara. And I hope everyone is considering joining the community of practice. I know they have really great stuff lined up and planned for you all. So um, you should definitely register. And of course, you can access the link on our website and you can also access it through your handout as well. Um, so with that, I will just wrap up um, if there are any questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, I'm not seeing any at this moment, but I also do want to give Alex the chance. Um, first of all, Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. But Alex, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with everyone? Well, one thing I just thought of as Patricia was speaking, one of the things I've seen that has great impact with legislators is when people who are impacted by the law actually come to speak. And uh, this was pre-Family Promise, but several years ago, we were in the legislature advocating for additional mass transit in Indianapolis. 
and we had representatives from the major employers, the major universities all testify. But what sold the members of the legislature and what changed votes, we had a certified nursing assistant who rode the bus every day and had to make three transfers to work and home from work every day. And she testified, and I was there and I saw it. At least three members of the House changed their vote on her testimony because she was somebody who used the transit system. So I strongly encourage people that, that when you're talking to your legislature, when the opportunity presents itself, encourage people who are really impacted by their votes to tell their story. Awesome, and, and that is so true. That point cannot be reiterated enough. Um, it's so important for them to hear directly from the persons who these things are affecting. Um, and thank you so much to Patricia and Alex for making those points. Um, thank, you. thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this entire series. I hope that you all have gained something from it or gained lots of things, hopefully. And of course, if you do have any um, other follow-up questions that you may think of afterwards, um, please feel free to email me, um, email Patricia, email Tamara, and um, we'll get you those answers. But once again, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.